Hello and welcome to Runkle and the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle, I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. I don't normally talk about U.S. law. I try to limit that to sort of once a month is kind of my informal policy, but it's been a while and I got a request to look at a couple of things that are happening in Washington state. And that is Senate Bill 5078, which is a magazine capacity limit bill, and 1705, which is a sort of ghost gun provision. So let's have a look at those, and I'm just going to offer the caution here. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. There's some things that I can see as I go through these that I think are relevant and worth pointing out. I can explain some of the likely effects of this and some likely problem areas, but I'm not going to be able to do sort of a deep dive into things like whether or not this is going to survive Second Amendment uh, scrutiny. So that's something, you know, and if you are facing... If this is something that's relevant to you personally, you may want to talk to a Washington state lawyer and get some individualized legal advice rather than my impressions of these uh, bills. But I'm going to start with 5078. Again, that's the magazine capacity limits bill. And we'll just jump right in here. It starts out by just sort of explaining what it's about, which is prohibiting the manufacture, importation, distribution, selling, and offering for sale of large capacity magazines. Now, when they say large capacity magazines, they mean more than 10 rounds. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we go here. But it starts off with this new section, and this is this lengthy preamble. And when I say lengthy, it's like 30 lines of text um, that basically just tries to justify why they're doing this. And this is not law. This is a preamble, but it's there because they anticipate that there might be uh, there might be challenges to this, that there's, people are going to take this to court. And so they're trying to kind of pack in this mission statement here uh, in the hopes that a court is going to uphold this. And also this is politics. I mean, they're explaining what they're doing here so that they can, because, I mean, obviously they're trying to get votes. That's why politicians do anything. Um so let's uh, have a look. I'm not going to go through this and read it to you in full detail. I'll link to it so you can check it out for yourself, but uh, I'm just going to look at some specific bits here. So they say the legislature finds and declares that gun violence is a threat to the public health and safety of Washingtonians. Firearms equipped with large capacity magazines increase casualties by allowing a shooter to keep firing for longer periods of time without reloading. Large capacity magazines have been used in all 10 of the deadliest mass shootings since 2009. So let's stop and talk about that because what does that mean? Like, is that a meaningful statement here? Well, um, as I said, they, they cut off uh, large capacity magazines at uh, 10 rounds, right? That's their definition. So I'm just going to go and have a look at a sort of random firearm here. You know, this the Glock 17. And I say random because I was looking at another file where a Glock 17 was used. So that's what I plugged in. So, you know, they've got a picture of one here. This is again from the Glock manufacturers page. And you can see what a standard capacity magazine looks like. The magazine length is basically dictated by the grip length. That's why it's sized the way it is, right? It just is a convenient fit for the gun. And what is the standard capacity? Well, that is 17 rounds. Okay. So, um, and you can see that they have optional 19, 24, 31, 33, but they're standard. What you'd get if you go to the store as a lawful gun buyer, you buy a Glock 17, is you're going to get 17 rounds, uh, which is, as they define it, a large capacity magazine. So when they say large capacity magazine, they mean the one you got with the gun, most likely. So yeah, no kidding, it was used in all sorts of things because, you know, that's what you'd expect. People are going to use the thing they bought with the gun. Okay. Um, so yeah, they also rely on anecdotal reports of uh, people being able to escape or disarm the shooter in a pause and reloading. Of course, they miss or they leave out the anecdotal reports of people getting killed trying the same things. And quite frankly... You know, anybody with fairly minimal amounts of practice, I am not an expert shooter uh, by any stretch, but uh, reloads aren't that slow. There's something you can take care of pretty quickly there. So, yeah, they keep going here. They talk about a whole bunch of things. They talk about the assault weapons ban. They talk about all sorts of things. But uh, one thing that I will 
kind of call out here. So they say, the legislature further finds that this is a well-calibrated policy based on evidence that magazine capacity limits do not interfere with responsible, lawful self-defense. Of course, they include an exception in this for law enforcement. And the reason why law enforcement carries firearms is to defend themselves. Um, in theory, law enforcement isn't going around because they want to murder people. Um, I mean, that's kind of, I, I feel like that should be a given. Uh, but that's something we can all hopefully accept is that law enforcement's purpose, at least, is not to go around, you know, murdering people for nothing. They have the guns for the purpose of self-defense. So why do you need an exception for law enforcement if it doesn't interfere with responsible, lawful self-defense? Hmm. I, I don't know how you sort of navigate that. Um, lawful self-defense is, you know, I don't know that the legislature ever has talked to any experts on it, but, um, uh, you know, this, it's, you're talking about the use of force and potentially lethal force, um, anything that's useful for law enforcement in those capacities is also going to be useful for civilians in those capacities. But they carry on and say some political things here that I think are a little touchy. So they say the legislature further finds that the threats to public safety posed by large capacity magazines are heightened given current conditions. Our country is in the midst of a pandemic, because of course they're going to mention a pandemic, economic recession, social tensions, and reckonings over racial justice. We're not going to do anything about those things, but we are going to restrict guns, which is this pattern that you see all the time. You know, we we have all these problems. We're not going to solve them, but we're going to take guns away because that's, you know, we're going to pretend that that's a solution there. But the reckonings over racial justice, that really just makes the hair on the back of my neck kind of come up here because... Um, are you really saying that you're wanting to restrict guns because you're afraid of Black Lives Matter? Um, yeah, uh, the history of gun control used as a means of targeting racial minorities is really ugly, both in the U.S. and in Canada. And I feel like if I was a legislature, that would not be what I'd want to, uh, to sort of put a flag on here. Yeah, so, yeah, and they also note that the legislature intends to limit the prospective sale of large capacity magazines while allowing existing legal owners to retain the large capacity uh, magazines they currently own. However, as we'll see as we go through this, there are going to be a whole bunch of legal pitfalls that those existing legal owners could fall into. So section two is amending things. Now, section two in this bill, as I'm looking at it, is real long. But that's because they're including all of the stuff from the section they're amending. So we're just going to look at the pits that they changed because we don't really need to go over the definition as it was and will continue to be for antique firearm, for example. But continuing on here, so there's a whole bunch of stuff. They say manufacture means with respect to a firearm and they're adding in or large capacity magazines. So they're wedging this in here the fabrication or construction of a firearm or large capacity magazine. There's also some little bits that they edited here that don't really matter. Um, they're changing the word 16 that was originally written out with letters to just 16 written out with uh, numerals. Um, they do that all through this with different uh, lengths. Um, I kind of prefer when I see legislative drafting the, uh, the lettering. And the reason why is because if you see 16 written out in letters, you know it wasn't a typo. But uh, I don't know why they're going through and fixing that in terms of amending uh, what is essentially a stylistic change. But they do that all through here in various places. And yeah. So carrying on here, we see now we'll get to the definition of large capacity magazine. And this is where we're going to start getting into some interesting legal questions. So large capacity magazine means an ammunition feeding device with the capacity to accept more than 10 rounds of ammunition or any conversion kit, part, or combination of parts from which such a device can be assembled if those parts are in possession of or in, under the control of the same person, but shall not be construed to include any of the following. So again, 10 rounds of ammunition is their limit there, and they include disassembled magazines as well as 
Now, I don't know how far they're wanting to go in terms of parts from which such a device can be assembled because uh, magazines are fairly uh, 3D printable. Lots of people have 3D printed mags out there. So is a 3D printer and a spring going to count? Mm, we'll have to see. That's going to be an open question. An ammunition feeding device that has been permanently... So this is an exclusion. It's not an inclusion. Um, an ammunition feeding device that has been permanently altered so that it cannot accommodate more than 10 rounds of ammunition. Now, I don't know what they're going to define as permanently altered here because, you know, Canada has uh, some standards there and our laws actually specify what that looks like. And uh, so we have provisions that sort of say, hey, um, you know, permanently altered means, you know, a rivet or certain other, it actually kind of goes through it in some detail. And I'm not going to go through all of that in this video, but uh, I'll just sort of show you what a Canadian permanently altered magazine looks like. And so this is a standard capacity AR mag, and you can see um, it's got a pin in it. Uh, that pin is installed. It's not coming out. You know, if I sort of bang on it and whatever else, sorry, I hope that doesn't mess up too bad in the mic, but you know, if I you know, even try to pry at it or whatever else. It's milled flush. It's not coming out easy. So it's permanent. It's not going to fall out anytime soon. But with enough effort, somebody, you know, could, if they wanted to, you know, commit a crime, remove that. Um, but it's going to be really interesting to see how this actually gets interpreted. And again, um, it's kind of a refrain on this channel, but whenever I say interesting, you should hear the word expensive as well. Somebody is going to end up getting charged because they have something just like this one. And it's going to cost them a ton of money to get that sorted out with a lawyer as to whether or not um, this is a legal item in the U.S. And as a Canadian who might end up traveling to the U.S. for participation in, say, shooting sports. I'm planning to go to Woodland Brutality uh, later on this year. Um, I would be nervous about taking this into Washington now, uh, once this law goes through. Uh, it doesn't include a 22 caliber tube ammunition feeding device, so you might see some special Washington, uh, Washington specified uh, uh, tube, tube firing firearms. Uh, or a tubular magazine that is contained in a lever action firearm. So cowboy guns are going to be excluded. Oh, I should show you the law as I go through it. Now, here's another place where this is a place that I think is going to create some potential pitfalls. Uh, distribute means to give out, provide, make available, or deliver a firearm or large capacity magazine to any person in the state with or without consideration, whether the distributor is in state or out of state. Distribute includes, but is not limited to, filling orders placed in the state, online or otherwise. Distribute also includes causing a firearm or large capacity magazine to be delivered in this state. Now, I'm wondering, this is an area where I will admit I have not got the benefit of being able to go through the case law. But when I see uh, provide or make available, I start wondering about, for instance, loaning a firearm. So if I have my gun with the original standard capacity magazine and I loan it to a buddy because he's going out hunting and I'm like, hey, take my take my shotgun, take my rifle. Um, is that now going to be a an offensive distribution? You know, what happens if we're a, you know, a couple, a husband, wife pair or, you know, husband, husband, whatever, um, you know, we're, you know, a family. And, you know, if I say, you know, provide, uh, if I've got my magazines and my kid goes shooting with, you know, the family magazines, is that distribution? If, you know, my wife goes with that, I got, you know, this makes me nervous here because I would like to see this, uh, pinned down in ways that, um, provide for the things that people ordinarily do. Um, it becomes really weird if you end up with a couple where you've got to have like his and hers uh, magazines. And again, I'm not trying to presume anything about, you know, anybody's relationship out there, but I am, this makes me nervous because this is the sort of place where people can commit crimes 
um, and potentially very serious crimes without really intending to sort of cross the boundaries into criminality. Um, I don't like laws that target people who make an oops, you know, in terms of understanding the law versus people who are out there trying to do wrong or, try, you know, knowingly committing offenses. Um, a law that targets somebody who goes out and says, hey, I'm going to rob a bank, I got no problem with as long as it's a reasonable law and so forth. But uh, ones that, yeah, I, these, these kinds of laws always bother me. So import means to move, transport, or receive an item from a place outside the territorial limits of the state of Washington to a place inside the territorial limits of the state of Washington. Now there is an exception here that I'll give them some credit for because this is the kind of thing that they could have easily missed or intentionally omitted, but they actually did include an exception here that I will, uh, I'll commend the drafters for this particular element. So import does not mean situations where an individual possesses a large capacity magazine when departing from and returning to Washington state, so long as the individual is returning to Washington in possession of the same large capacity magazine the individual transported out of state. So if you are in Washington and you have a standard capacity magazine and you go to, you know, Utah for a shooting competition and then you travel back to Washington, you can bring your magazine back but you can't go and buy extras. So that's what that is. That's what that covers. That's what that exception handles. Um, I guess good on them for including the exception, but I don't like the law as a whole. So moving on, they now add a new section to read as follows. No person in this state may manufacture, import, distribute, sell, or offer for sale any large capacity magazine, except as authorized in this section. So we're gonna see a bunch of exceptions. Uh, the exception first is uh, buy a licensed farm, uh, firearms manufacturer for the purposes of sale to any branch of the armed forces, the United States, or to a law enforcement agency for use by that agency or its employees for law in law enforcement purposes. So already we're seeing exceptions for armed forces and law enforcement. Now, armed forces, of course, are, you know, we expect that they might go on the offensive. They might attack things, you know, and so forth. Law enforcement, typically, you know, we say that they shouldn't be going out to kill people just to defend themselves in the course of their actions. So any law enforcement purpose is a self-defense purpose. So if they're saying it's not good for self-defense, I disagree. B, the importation, distribution, offer for sale, or sale of a large capacity magazine by a dealer that is properly licensed. So this is the same thing, but as the manufacturer provision, but applies to dealers. Okay, and it's got exactly the same provisions as to the armed forces or law enforcement. I don't know why they didn't just make one section that said licensed firearms manufacturer or dealer, but they decided to make it two separate provisions. The distribution offer for sale, etc., cetera, uh, to or by a dealer that is properly licensed under federal or state law, where the dealer acquires that uh, from a person uh, legally authorized to possess or transfer the large capacity magazine. So this is just how dealers get the stuff from manufacturers. Okay. And uh, for the purpose of selling or transferring the large capacity magazine to a person who does not reside in the state. So this is a provision to allow you to get those magazines out of the state, which of course they want to see happen under this. All right, and they say that if you violate this, you are guilty of a gross misdemeanor punishable under Section 9A20. I'm not going to look up what the sentencing is. Um, the U.S. is kind of weird in terms of their sentencing, the way they do it. Or I say weird, it's different from what I'm used to as a Canadian lawyer. Um, I don't know what the range is for a gross misdemeanor versus a non-gross misdemeanor. All right, so they have another section here. Distributing, selling, offering for sale, or facilitating the sale, distribution, or transfer of a large capacity magazine online is an unfair or deceptive act or practice or unfair method of competition in the conduct of trade or commerce for the purposes of the Consumer Protection Act. So this would bring it under the offenses of the Consumer Protection Act. Now, in terms of the facilitating the sale, distribution, or transfer, I don't know what all is involved in that. Um, I mean, if you are running a web page for somebody who's selling this, that would seem to be included. Um, what about if you are, say, a YouTube channel and you are running ads? 
for, you know, magazines on your YouTube channel. And I think YouTube actually has rules against that, but imagining for this for a second that they didn't um we've actually already seen them go after people who were selling little metal cards with you know sort of engravings or cutouts in them um and they also went after people who were advertising this on youtube so that is a potential concern here and a potential risk for people who provide online uh, services of various varieties there's also a provision here that is kind of interesting. They say if any provision of this act or its application to any person or circumstance is held invalid, the remainder of the act or the application of the provision to other persons or circumstances is not affected. So this is trying to essentially immunize or protect it against uh, Second Amendment uh, concerns. And they seem to be trying to do it by saying um, that each person has to run their own case. I would really like to talk to a U.S. lawyer to just see how well these provisions hold up in practice. Because to me, this seems like a way to tell the court that, hey, court, we're limiting your authority. And I don't think Canadian courts would put up with this all that much. But I can't speak to whether or not a U.S. court would. And this effect, uh, act takes effect July 1st, 2022. I understand the act is about to be passed, so... If you are in Washington, that is a day to put in your calendar. I suspect that there's going to be a whole lot of people buying a whole lot of magazines between now and July 1st, 2022. So some considerations here is that um, in terms of how do you establish things like, you know, that you already had these magazines. I've seen some suggestions that you might want to document which things you have. Well, the risk, I mean, this is kind of a, a mixed thing because now you're generating evidence that could potentially be used to say that a particular magazine wasn't something you possessed. And so as an example, let's say I take a picture of me with my magazine or I do a YouTube video with it. Um, and then later I decide, you know what would be really cool? I'm going to take this magazine and I'm going to paint it. And I'm going to, you know, maybe I take it to somebody who can do this professionally and, you know, they make it a really cool design. And now this is, you know, looks really badass. And well, now if I'm ever caught with this, they might say, hey, you have this picture of all the magazines and we don't see that painted one. And you might think this is ridiculous, but people have ended up in court over way dumber things than that. And then you end up having to testify in this proceeding, which is always risky to talk about how you went and painted it. So, or, you know, find the person who painted it and get them to testify. That's a, an unpleasant place. But in terms of, you know, so that's a thought about you're generating evidence that could potentially be used for or against you in a criminal proceeding. But there's also non-criminal ways that they can use laws like this. Like, for instance, seeking to engage in civil forfeiture and just, we're not going to charge you, but we are going to take your magazine. So um, if that's something you're considering, you may want to talk to a, a lawyer about all of this. Um, you may also want to look at buying more magazines. His, you know, it doesn't appear that this is in effect here. And again, you know, don't, don't take anything I'm saying here as advice. Uh, talk to a lawyer, but... Um, you know, his and you might need to think about magazines for every member of your family if they're going to interpret this distribution as applying to uh, sharing magazines within a household. So, yeah, I uh, I suspect that the that a lot of gun stores are going to be doing a lot of business in a short period here. But uh, yeah, I don't see anything anything that sort of really covers that. Um, I could be wrong. So again, talk to a lawyer in Washington if this is a concern. All right, so let's continue on with House Bill 1705, which is again a bill about ghost guns. And how do we know that that's what they're worrying about? Well, they start off right by using that term in the introduction here. So an act relating to limiting ghost guns, including untraceable firearms and untraceable unfinished firearms, and receivers that can be used to manufacture or assemble untraceable firearms, with exceptions for manufacturers, dealers, and importers, uh, permanently inoperable firearms, antiques, or ones manufactured before 1968. 
I'm not sure why they picked 1968 there, although I'm probably missing some obvious uh, bit of firearm history, probably relating to the AR-15. But uh, all right, so let's have a look at what all they're doing here. It starts out with a uh, civil infraction bit, and this one's kind of interesting. Uh, you can see where they've edited stuff about $250, but uh, they talk about adding to the civil infraction things, uh, untraceable firearms pursuant to section four of this act or unfinished frames or receivers pursuant to section five of this act, in which case the maximum penalty and default amount is $500. Uh, the thing that kind of jumped out at me and why I'm, and this is not a new part of this. This is actually already existing in the law, but they're talking about or violent video or computer games under RCW 9.91.180. And I'm kind of curious about that because yeah, that's that's a strange thing, and there's always this push to try to limit, uh, you know, what is effectively free speech or free expression uh, with these violent video or computer game rules. Uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll shoot uh, Mr. Hogue at virtual legality a question about this one because I'm kind of curious. And while I'm doing sort of a shout out here, I'll also give a shout out to Deviant Olaf who is uh, one basically a main reason why I'm doing this video. So check out his stuff as well. Uh, they're both fantastic. All right, let's have a look at some of the things they changed here. So this is a definition section that they've added and definition sections are always really important. They tell us what we're dealing with and what we're looking at. So frame or receiver means a part of a firearm uh, that when the complete firearm is assembled is visible from the exterior and provides housing or a structure designed to hold or integrate one or more fire control components, even if pins or other attachments are required to connect the fire control components. Now, one bit that kind of leaps out at me here is the bit about visible from the exterior. I don't know why they included that. Um, I mean, that is certainly the case with most guns that I think about in terms of having a, uh, a frame. But I don't know that that's necessarily an element of a frame. Um, and I, just to pick a really kind of silly example, I think, you know, I find myself picturing a gun wrapped in burlap. Um, you could still shoot that gun, but you wouldn't be able to see necessarily any part of the gun from the exterior. So I'm wondering if that isn't a, a bit of a drafting error. Um, but they're giving us an idea here. And I will say that Overall, they're providing a fair degree of clarity about what they're talking about when they say frame or receiver, which is useful because the, the judges who have to interpret this are not necessarily going to be people who are familiar with firearms. And so it's good that they can potentially look at this and look at a firearm and understand what uh, what's being talked about. And I think that that's helpful. It's much better than the Canadian law just says frame or receiver and then leaves it to the court to know what that is. So that uh, tends to require more expert evidence and more uh, can create more issues. So they continue on. Any such part identified with a serial number shall be presumed absent an official determination by the ATF or a rely other reliable evidence to the contrary to be a frame or receiver. So um, that's a, a legal presumption. But this is a rebuttable presumption, and it's interesting that it's a rebuttable presumption either on evidence in court or potentially if you can just say, listen, the ATF says this isn't a frame or receiver, so it's not. Um, it's I find it interesting that they're involving the ATF in that fashion. Um, it also is a one way uh, on that rebutting aspect. It doesn't indicate that uh, if the ATF says something that it is a frame or receiver, that that is evidence here. So that's just kind of curious, but they also continue on for the purpose of the subsection fire control component, which is good. I'm glad they're defining this because otherwise that would be a, a potentially confusing term means a component necessary for the firearm to initiate, complete, or continue the firing sequence, including any of the following hammer, bolt, bolt carrier, breech block, cylinder, trigger mechanism, firing pin, striker, or slide rails. So that gives it that the reason why they give us that list is that we know what kind of part they're talking about with a fire control component. And this seems to be to, you know, excluding things like the barrel or, you know, those, that kind of element. So this, 
again, provides us with a pretty clear understanding of what they mean by a frame or receiver. And I like that. I mean, I don't approve of the bill overall, but I like this degree of specificity. So continuing on here, you can see they're doing some renumbering. We're not going to worry about that. Manufacturer, they change the language. I don't think this, uh, they add making, formation, production, or by manual labor or by machinery. I don't see a whole lot of reason to be concerned about that either way. I don't know that it was necessary, but um, I guess they're tidying up the language. Fair enough. So now they're going to define some additional things. Unfinished frame or receiver means a frame or receiver that is partially complete and partially complete is going to actually have its own specified definition as we go through. Disassembled or inoperable that one has reached a state in manufacture where it may readily be completed, assembled, converted, or restored to a functional state, or two is marketed or sold to the public to become or be used as the frame or receiver of a functional firearm once finished or completed, including, without limitation, product marketed or sold to the public as an 80% frame or receiver or an unfinished frame or receiver. So this is important because it, it also hinges on how you sell it. So if you are selling things as an 80% frame or receiver or advertising um, this, this thing where it's, you know, you're saying, hey, this is an almost ready firearm, um, then that itself is going to make out this definition, which in turn may make out an offense. For the purposes of this subsection, and I like how they're going to go on and define what readily uh, means, but the definition is still going to be super fuzzy. So, and that leaves us with a whole lot of interesting, meaning expensive questions. Readily means a process that is fairly or reasonably efficient, quick and easy, but not necessarily the most efficient, speedy or easy process. If you're confused at this point, well, um, so am I. Factors relevant in making this determination with no single one controlling. Oh, good. That's wonderful. We've got a whole bunch of factors with no guidance on how to weigh them. Include the following. A, time, i.e. how long it takes to finish the process. B, ease, how difficult it is to do so. C, expertise, i.e. what knowledge and skills are required. D, equipment, i.e. what tools are required. E, availability, i.e. whether additional parts are required and how easily they can be obtained. F, expense, i.e. how much it costs. G, scope, i.e. the extent to which the uh, subject of the process must be changed to finish it. And H, feasibility, i.e. whether the process would damage or destroy the subject of the process or cause it to malfunction. Okay, so, I mean, the problem is, is that eventually the courts are going to have to sort out what all of this means because... Anything could theoretically be turned into a firearm so long as it's made of materials that are suitable. And so, you know, are we talking about like raw aluminum ore or are we talking about like a 99% receiver? I'm guessing it's somewhere along that continuum that they're talking about, but it's not super clear to me where that cutoff is. And given that this is a cutoff where on one side you're talking about fully legal activity and on the other side you're talking about go to jail, it's really important to know where that line is. Um, so that's, uh, that's always a concern here because I don't find this to be, I mean, they indicate what things the court needs to consider, but it's not super, super specified. Uh, this makes it, potentially quite dangerous to buy uh, components that you might use to make your own gun. And there's ways to get around that in this bill, but uh, we'll have a look at those as they go. So partially complete as it modifies frame or receiver means a forging, casting, printing, extrusion, machine body, or similar article that has reached a state in a uh, stage in manufacture where it is clearly identifiable as an unfinished component of a firearm. Now, identifiable to whom? Because if you are, for instance, a gunsmith, you might be able to readily identify something as an unfinished component that if I gave it to a random person on the street, they would go, I don't know what this is. It doesn't look like anything. Um, this could cover like really 
uh, raw castings, you know, where it's basically just a, a blob of metal that would take a great deal of knowledge and skill to turn into anything firearm related. So, um, yeah, it's really not super clear as to what this means. So untraceable firearm means any firearm manufactured after July 1st. It is not an antique and that cannot be traced by law enforcement by means of a serial number affixed uh, by a, and they say federal firearms manufacturer, federal firearms importer, or federal firearms dealer in compliance with all federal laws and regulations. All right. And they're going to amend some additional sections here. So let's look at the amending parts. Uh, manufacturer and they're adding cause to be manufactured, assemble, or cause to be assembled an untraceable firearm with the intent to sell the untraceable firearm. Okay, so they're adding the causing to be manufactured, assembling, or causing to be assembled. Um, that, I guess, is just a clarity change here. Uh, section 4 is a new section entirely. So this is new text that they're adding. No person may manufacture, cause to be manufactured, assemble, or cause to be assembled an untraceable firearm. Uh, no person may knowingly or recklessly possess, transport, or receive an untraceable firearm unless the party possessing, transporting, or receiving the untraceable firearm is a law enforcement agency or a federal firearm importer, a federal firearm manufacturer, or federal firearms dealer. So um, you can't even possess these. Uh, you can't off sell, offer to sell, transfer, or purchase an untraceable firearm. And this doesn't apply to things that are permanently inoperable, antiques, or before 1968, uh, or has been imprinted by a federal firearm dealer or other uh, federal licensee authorized to provide marketing services. So this is basically saying if you have one and you want to make it legal, you got to throw a serial number on it. Um, and it's got to be done not by you, but by a firearm dealer or somebody authorized to do that. Uh, civil infraction and shall be assessed a monetary penalty of $500. Um, I'm guessing that that, now I don't know for certain, but I'm guessing that that means that they're trying to avoid a criminal record on that. Um, that is my guess. And again, um, I'm probably going to get uh, an American lawyer or somebody American knowledgeable saying, hey, Runkle, uh, you're wrong about this or whatever else, but that's that's my guess. But they say if you've previously been found to have violated the section, then you are guilty of a misdemeanor. And that to me sounds like criminal record at that point. Uh, two or more times previously, then it's a gross misdemeanor. So this looks like they're increasing the punishment and the sentencing each time. Uh, if you do so by manufacturing, causing it to be manufactured or about, you know, a number of other things, uh, then you're guilty of a gross or sorry, three or more untraceable firearms at a time. Uh, then it's a gross misdemeanor, and it's a separate violation for each and every firearm to which this section applies. So that's a charging provision as to how they would uh, pursue you. So a new section here, no person may knowingly or recklessly possess, transport, or receive an unfinished frame or receiver. So again, the simple possession of it or the transportation or various other things will be an offense uh, unless... You're a law enforcement agency or a federal firearm importer, manufacturer, or firearm dealer, or it's been imprinted with a serial number uh, as mentioned before. So again, they want you to take these things and get them serialized. No person may sell, offer to sell, transfer, or purchase an unfinished frame or receiver uh, unless you're an uh, importer, manufacturer, or dealer, or it's been imprinted with a serial number as per those restrictions. Uh, doesn't apply to anything that's been imprinted. And then we're going to get into penalties again. Starts with a civil infraction of infraction at 500 bucks and goes up from there. And so this is a provision. Section 6 is a new section at talking about how you go about imprinting it. So federal firearm dealer or licensee uh, may imprint it. And it must be done in a specified fashion. So... Uh, their firearms license uh, number as a prefix, uh, followed by a hyphen, and then so forth. Uh, has to be placed in a manner that uh, meets the requirements, so size and depth, and not able to be readily obliterated, altered, or removed. 
and it must not duplicate any serial numbers placed by the federal firearms dealer or other federal licensee on any other firearm. So they can't just serialize every single firearm at, with the same number. And uh, they have to retain records on that. And all of this is so that they can track these guns down theoretically uh, if they wish. Now, they also add uh, or they're amending provisions about background checks. And I'm just looking at what they've changed here. It just changes this numbering, uh, it looks like. So don't, you may see that there's the background check aspect. Um, it looks like they just changed a numbering provision. All of that was uh, remaining, otherwise remaining the same. They also add in this provision, just like in the other bill where they say if any provision of this act or its application to any uh, person or circumstance is held invalid, then the remainder of the act is to otherwise be unaffected and also takes into effect uh, July 1st, 2022. Now, unlike this, unlike the magazine one where they said, hey, um, you know, if you have a magazine before the date it comes into effect, then you get to keep it. Uh, this one works the other way, which is that after all of this, that uh, once it goes into effect, simply possessing these firearms will itself be an offense unless you've gone and gotten them serialized serialized so that uh there may be people who end up getting prosecuted because they didn't hear that that was something they had to do so if you have one um you may want to talk to a lawyer about what you should do about it but it looks like again from the uh, take of somebody who is unqualified to give legal advice in in Washington state and is not purporting to do so. This is just my impression as a Canadian lawyer, um, but it looks like that is intended to be the way to uh, bring those firearms into legal compliance is to get them serialized. Um, so lots of people don't want, you know, serial numbers on their firearms for a lot of reasons, but largely it comes down to the the element of confiscation, the element that uh, this is basically preparing uh, things so that a future government could try to find these things and seize them, which, um, I mean, I'm here in Canada. We're seeing that happening right now. So uh, I got some sympathy for that because there's a lot of people here in Canada who are potentially going to be facing seizures or, um, or criminal sanctions when the amnesty runs out. Uh, we'll be seeing a fair fair bit of that and unfortunately i guess i'll be here to cover it when that happens but um yeah i'm not looking forward to that at all um i mean it's channel content but i would much rather be talking about um you know anything else pretty much uh but somebody's got to provide some information on it anyway thank you for watching i hope that this has been useful um let me know in the comments below. Uh, I, I, in particular, I think the magazine restriction one is especially dumb. Um, competition shooting is done with, you know, standard capacity magazines because competition shooting is done on a clock. And, you know, you need to be able to practice to compete against people in other jurisdictions who aren't going to be under those same restrictions. And, I mean, the other thing is that you'll end up with, in Washington state, there'll probably be shooting competitions where they're like, hey, you can bring whatever legal magazines you own. And so somebody who predates the ban, who was into shooting beforehand, uh, will have an advantage over the newbies. I don't like that. As a new shooter, I would like to imagine that the difference between me and the excellent you know, guy on the field is, you know, he's probably got better equipment because he knows what's good and has practiced with things and has made investments. I'm probably starting out with just beginner gear, but I would like to think that one day if I get my skills down and so forth, that I'll be able to compete with them because we're all on the same playing field, but that will probably not be the case. Um, yeah, I don't think that this is likely to accomplish what they think it's going to accomplish. I don't think that this is going to meaningfully affect, uh, you know, homicide in any fashion, but uh, I guess we'll see. And the problem that we'll run into, of course, is that a lot of the research on, and I'm going to say the research on both sides of the gun control argument, tends to be done by people who are uh, looking to prove a point. 
and not so much approaching it from a scientific, um, neutral, unbiased point of view. And I mean, I say this as somebody who is, you know, I'm not a scientist. I'm coming at this with a viewpoint. I'm not just doing sort of, you know, you, if you've been a watcher, you know who I am, you know, sort of what my opinions are on things generally, probably, but I try to present the law in an accurate and fair fashion. But um, science, depending on how you want to do some of these studies, there's various ways you can kind of shade and shape your research to get the result you want. And if you know something about research design, and I say this, I've taken a few courses in research design. I'm not an expert in it, but you know, I'm, I've taken some courses to, to look at it. And there's places where I can spot glaring problems in it. And, and again, that applies to the researchers, you know, some of the pro-gun researchers and lots of the anti-gun researchers where you can say, oh man, that is a research, you know, that is either incompetent or shady. So I'm sure we're going to see research on this with various opinions and some of it will even be okay. But, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll have to see sort of as we go, but, uh, I do have criticisms on a lot of the state of, uh, firearm research as it, uh, as it exists and whether it is actually, uh, stuff that is capable of proving the point or even providing useful evidence towards what it says it's going to establish. That is an entirely separate rant, however, and I think I've probably been talking for almost an hour here. So let's uh, wrap this up with thank you to my Patreon supporters at the $50 level, Jonathan Wheeler, Canada's National Firearms Association, Kyle Martin, the CCFR and the Canadian Shooting Sports Association, at the $30 level, Sites and Arms Limited and Mark Olivier Damour, and at the $20 level, Peter Hilger, Mark Whittington, Jane Babin Luxor, Haywire, Dale Nesbitt, Cameron Johnson, Bruno R., Andrew Elsich, and Aaron Del So. Thank you as well to my $10 supporters who are going to be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you for watching. I hope this has armed you with knowledge and see you next time.